the HBO hit show Game of Thrones had a difficult time adapting George R. R. Martin's epic book series, A Song of Ice and Fire, to the television medium at an approximate rate of 10 episodes per novel, and still failed to meet much of the fandom's expectations when concluding an unfinished book series. Now, Wheel of Time showrunner Rafe Judkins has an equally daunting task, but coming from the exact opposite direction, having an exuberant number totaling 14 books to adapt to either a six or seven season series consisting of eight episodes each. Will he face criticism for cutting some of the fandom's favorite settings or characters? How is he, or even how can he, possibly thread that needle that has eluded so many fantasy adaptation predecessors? We are going to explore how Rafe might tackle this beast, having already adapted one season to primarily only the first book of Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time book series titled Eye of the World. Welcome back to Bust and Blockbusters. Double M, Matt Murdock here with you as always. And today we are once again exploring season two of The Wheel of Time coming on Amazon Prime on September 1st of 2023, taking different pieces of news and information regarding the season and combining that with book knowledge to try and figure out the question I just posed. As a disclaimer, I never have been nor will be a scholar or expert regarding Robert Jordan's books, and I merely call myself a fan of both the books and the show. I will be doing a lot of speculation in this podcast, but will, as often as possible, try to make these speculations based on the storylines from Robert Jordan's Book 2, The Great Hunt, and Book 3, The Dragon Reborn, as well as coupling that knowledge with real-world news and information regarding possible episode titles, show castings, and any available visual news or information collected prior to this recording. Needless to say, a spoiler warning must now be served to non-book readers. If you have not read The Great Hunt and The Dragon Reborn, and do not wish to possibly be spoiled by my presentation of information and speculation in equal parts, I urge you to leave the podcast fairly quickly from here. Our spoiler-filled discussion regarding Rafe's daunting task of adapting books two and three into a singular season two begins now. So you've been warned of all spoilers, and if you're leaving, thanks for listening up to this point. Here at the start, it is very important to acknowledge that while I organize information pretty well, I'm not heralded as a great investigator for information and am considered at best an adequate presenter. It is for this reason that I must give credit where credit is due regarding the collection of information I am presenting today, and you will find these links in the show notes. Much of the news information I present is thanks to the hard work of WOTseries.com, John at the What Up YouTube channel, and the Twitter account of Me Raving Mad, run by a co host of Queers of Time podcast and a coordinator of JordanCon. Thanks to the combined efforts of these sources, we have episode title information, casting, and press junket information regarding the pictures that we've discussed in the prior two podcasts. And today I'll also be utilizing two maps of the main continent where Wheel of Time takes place as well. One map, beautifully done, will be used courtesy of Atlas of Search and Fire blog.wordpress.com and a larger scope map by wheeloftimelines.com where you can also find an interactive version of it. Once again, thanks to all of these content creators for assisting me to collect the information needed for this presentation, and I urge all of my listeners to use the links that I've provided in the show notes to explore great content from all of these providers. And with that said, this is your final spoiler warning before I start diving into specific spoilers. You have been warned. There are several roadmaps of information, roadmaps that we can use in order to determine the trajectory of Season 2. But for a trajectory to have any kind of context, we need to first establish where each of our beloved characters are at the end of Season 1. 
We're going to be pulling from our Song of Ice and Fire blog map, and we can see that all but one of our main characters ended the season either in the Blight or in the borderland Shinoran city of Faldora. The one character exception to that being Matt Cawthon, and we'll get to him in a second. We have Egwene and Nynaeve, post nearly burning out, and just in case you're a non-book reader and still here by choice, burning out is a term used for taking in more of the one power than you can handle. This can kill you, as it did uh, that Lady Amalisa, and as it nearly killed Egwene and Nynaeve themselves, or it can even possibly just make you unable to use the one power anymore after overloading, so to speak. Luckily for our characters, Burning Out seems to have been avoided or perhaps reversed for the two of them. In the main castle, we of course have Perrin, who is now having witnessed Pat and Fane steal the Horn of Valir, the thing that all the Shinarans were trying to keep safe under a throne in a very obvious place. But Pat and Fane didn't just take the horn, he of course seriously injured, though evidently did not kill our beloved Ogier, Loyal, and other Shinarans that we like, like Uno, despite any appearances that they were completely dead. And although she may be considered to not be a main character, she's still one of my favorites, so I'm going to comment that Min is headed south away from Faldara on a wagon, all the while after the battle with the Dark One slash Ishmael, we see Rand, Moraine, and Land all up in the Blight, north of Faldara. Rand, of course, is convinced that he's going to go mad because he is the Dragon Reborn, and so he wants to be away from his friends so that he doesn't hurt them. He abandons them and Moraine and Land at the Seal, and he's headed out somewhere deeper into the Blight, although it looked like he was turning back towards Faldara, and then he veered off to one side or the other. I couldn't tell if he was looking south at Fardara, then it looked like he was turning east. And then, of course, you have Moraine and Lan at the seal, where Lan has found her, and she claims that she cannot feel the One Power anymore, saying that the Dark One slash Ishmael has cut her off from the One Source. And I'll get back to that in a second as well. Finally, our one out-of-sorts character we have is Matt Cawthon, who has basically declined the invitation to face the Dark One and possibly die, and is instead seemingly returning to Tarvalon as we see the White Tower in the background as he's looking up. And before we go any further, I just want to point some things out that Rafe may have been trying to do in order to accent the cliffhangerness of the end of the season or make things mysterious or in a mysterious way that to me didn't really come off all that well as far as the execution goes for the final episode for instance the identity of the dark one is still kind of misleading and muddled especially i would think to show only viewers and especially when you consider that the actor that was playing the quote-unquote dark one Uh, was credited as playing Ishmael. We as book readers know that the Dark One has a different name than that, and we know who Ishmael is. But it seemed like a pointless thing to wait until the next season to reveal this kind of thing. Maybe I'm just taking advantage of the fact that we get these kinds of reveals in book one, and we don't have to wait for a book two to find some of this stuff out. But either way, I could see how viewers could be confused as to, well, who did Rand actually face? Especially when you hear other things that get said in the very first promotional bit that was played at a comic con where Moraine basically says, oh, we didn't defeat the Dark One. Instead, we just released his strongest lieutenant. Now, granted, his strongest lieutenant may not be Ishmael, but I think... Dark One is not Ishmael. There you go. I also think that the strongest lieutenant might actually be Lanfear, but we've got a ways to go on that. I just don't understand why we will have thrown that extra layer of confusion in for TV-only people. 
And while we're here, let's talk about Moraine's loss of power as well. She doesn't define it one way or the other uh, as to being stilled or gentled. All she says is that she can't touch the source. And I really think that that is a great cliffhanger that we, of course, know is not part of the books. And I will commend Ray for the fact that he establishes to where you could actually tell the difference, even though she didn't say the words. When Loghain is captured and he is being kept from the one power by the three weavers, Leandrin, Kirene, and Alana, they are actually actively working to keep him from being able to access the one power, and that's called shielding. That's opposed to what they did to him at the very end of episode four, where they completely stripped him of his power, never to be touched again. That is what they call gentling for men and stilling for women. You're either gentled or you're stilled. But the problem that I have with the last bit with Moraine is the fact that they're almost playing it up like they want you to think that she's still because she seems so distraught by it in the same way that we saw Loghain distraught by it in episode 6, in the same way that in episode 4 we heard Tom Marilyn tell Rand about how his nephew Owen was so distraught that he killed himself because he had been stripped of the one power. And they make Moraine seem really not together. In the books we know that when people get shielded, they'll still try to fight it. They try to find the place where the weave is what we call tied off. And that means that you can actually leave the magic set on a person without having to actively put magic on them all the time. You just tie it off like a knot. And so therefore the weave stays. The magic is still effective. She's still cut off from the source. But she can't really find how to undo the knot. Or maybe she can. But it'll by that time, it may be too late for her because the bad person might have gotten away or the bad person might have killed her. But that's not what I'm seeing. Usually you see someone in the books when they are being shielded, f- try to fight against that. Moraine has no fight in her. She's like she's given up. She's exactly like Loghain. It's almost like she's looking at land like she's saying, just kill me. And I had a problem with that because I felt like that was a little bit too overdone the acting there could have been a little more subtle and so therefore uh, it wouldn't be frustrating for tv only people when this coming season lorraine's probably going to find another Aes Sedai to help her find the little knot in the shield that's been tied off and she'll instantly have her powers back because the shield's been removed again i will give rafe credit for showing both ways but the problem is, is that he didn't demonstrate how a shield can be tied off. We seemed like we had to have those three Aes Sedai all the time holding the shield against him because he was just too strong. Maybe a strength of it could be something to do with it. But Maureen's pretty strong too, and all they had to do was tie one off for her. So I kind of have a problem with that. But despite all of my bickering here, I really am excited for season two. And now that we know where everyone is, we can start to put some newer information that I actually was not aware of regarding these images until recently, those images that we were discussing in the last two podcasts. There's a little more context to those as to which episodes that they are tied, and that will help us see the trajectory of where they're going. This context actually comes from two different directions. The first being that many Wheel of Time content providers discovered simultaneously that by investigating the Writers Guild of America website, you could discover six episode titles that were submitted as the titles for scripts for Season 2 of Wheel of Time. Now those titles, which I will read in just a moment, I will cite the source for this as being at me raving mad on Twitter, as I mentioned them before. But we also got additional context regarding the images, the still images themselves that were released with the Entertainment Weekly article. And evidently, these images were tied to specific episode numbers. 
And John from the What Up YouTube channel had a press junket that revealed that information. So John combined the two pieces of information and came up with a possible order of the episode titles for the first six episodes of season two. And using the images and the story of books two and three helped him to do so. I'm going to give you John's proposed episode order of titles as I agree with the reasoning for this order. And I'm also going to use that information that he revealed about the images, as well as other visual and textual information offered to us from official sources, such as the Wheel of Time Twitter, Q&A sessions with the showrunner, and of course, any other interviews from an official capacity. And I'll be elaborately speculating on what we might see within each episode from episode to episode. I do want to, uh, once again, credit John from the What Up YouTube channel as I give you the complete context that I'm basing everything on. John released a video on May 26th of 2023 revealing his speculation of the order of the episode titles, where he also mentioned the episodes that the images that we've been discussing lately are cited to be part of. So let's go through those photos first. And once again, we're really getting into spoilers here. So this is your absolute last warning. Both the photos of Egwene in the kitchen and of Matt with a single tear are tied to the first episode of season one. The images of Nynaeve and of Lan are both tied to episode three. Episode 4 of Season 2 produces the image of Moraine in her regal-looking dress. Season 2, Episode 5 is tied to the image of the Shan Shan, which we book readers have likely speculated is Seroth and Alwyn, the voice of Seroth, and of course Loyal, and the character that the show calls the Dark One slash Ishmael is also present. And finally, both the image of Rand in his Jedi robe and the image of Avienda standing very fiercely, uh, looking like she's about to attack somebody as she stands next to Perrin, are tied to the season two finale for episode eight. Now, we don't have a title for the last two episodes as of yet, but this information helped John to speculate that the order of the title of the episodes as they were found on the WGA website might be the following. We know pretty much for a fact that the title of episode one is called A Taste of Solitude. This one is pretty much confirmed to have been documented atop the season premiere script due to a slip up by the Wheel of Time promotions team. Again, it is the only confirmed title matching an episode number And remember that episode titles still may change before the episodes air. But using the at me raving mad Twitter info, John from What Up Channel further deduced the title for episode two to be Eyes Without Pity. Episode three, he proposed, would be What Might Be. Episode four, Strangers and Friends. Episode 5, Damani, which is interestingly, no matter which version of the two words that you're using, is misspelt. Is it intentional? Is it just an error? I don't want to speculate on that one way or the other, but there are two different contexts to the pronunciation of Damani. One is, of course, referring to a culture of people that live somewhat in the West, and the other context of that word refers to a specific station in the culture of the Shan Shan. The Damani are women in the Shan Shan culture who can channel, but are basically enslaved to do so. And they are controlled by other women who you may see standing behind them, as we did in the season one finale, called Sudam. And finally, for episode six, because we only have titles for episodes one through six, and there's only one left, We settle on Daughter of the Night. As I said, John's reasonings for making the conclusions that he did, I found to be very sound, and I'm going to use those conclusions as a template for my own speculations here. And again, these are merely speculations. So please feel free to seek me out and laugh at me for my errors as the season unfolds in September. So let's begin our speculative journey considering everything that we know so far. 
with Season 2, Episode 1, A Taste of Solitude. We know by piecing together book knowledge with at least three images released by Entertainment Weekly that our story, with a possible time jump placed somewhere in the season, perhaps at the very beginning, that many of our characters who we last saw at or near Faldara will end up in a city called Fama. In the books, this is the main invasion and holding point for the Shan Shan. It's on the western coast, and we know that we will see that location at least by episode 5, because that's where our first image of Falma is located, with the Shan Shan, the Dark One, and Loyal. We also know, due to the press junket, that the final climax for the season will likely take place in that same location as well, by looking at the images of Rand and of Avienda with Perrin. Remember that this leaves us with almost the entirety of the Westerlands for our characters to have to travel during the course of this season. Now, most of this trek in the books is spent in pursuit of Padden Fane, who, of course, has stolen the Horn of Valir. Yet with the changes in the television story at the end of Season 1, the pursuit may be slightly more staggered than in the books. Rand in the TV story has no idea that the horn has even been taken and has decided to isolate himself, moving away from Faldara. It is possible that if he is traveling east into the Blight, along the border with the Blight, he could accidentally stray into the Aeol Waste by turning south and encounter some of the Aeol. And this might be the reason for some of the Aeol seeing him and gathering knowledge about him. In Season 2 promotional material, we see filming of Aeol in a setting that kind of matches the desolate area where other footage shows Rand being tied to a wheel. And with that, one might think that perhaps Rand has wandered into the waste and been captured by the Aeol. But I'm not certain this is the case, and neither is a lot of the rest of the fandom. Most in the fandom actually place Rand being tied to the wheel as a metaphor in perhaps a dream that Rand has, Maybe a dream being manipulated by the Dark One slash Ishmael, as we've seen in other dreams from Season 1. Another thing to note, of course, is the fact that in the promotional footage, when Rand is tied to that wheel, his head has been shaved of most of his hair. While I suppose it could be argued that the Aeols themselves might have shaved Rand's head, here I am simply going to apply Occam's razor and agree with most of the fandom. Now, I just want to say that this doesn't make me think that Rand won't stray into the Waste, but merely that he might encounter, or at least be witnessed by Aeol in the first episode, spawning interest in the prophecies and what the Aeol refer to as the Karakhan. I don't really believe that he will be captured by the Aeol, so to speak, and I certainly don't believe that the Wheel is part of that capture. And this is actually where I believe that Rand's story will be be in episode one and it may just be that even just kind of a fairly brief check-in with him even though he's a main character there is a whole lot to do in this episode that is away from him as i stated before the images in the press junket that are linked to episode one are the image of Egwene, who is clearly working in the kitchens of the white tower and of matt who we saw returning to tarvalin at the end of season one Because Egwene is in the tower, this is the main reason why I believe the season will show a time jump in the very first episode. There is naturally not near as much distance between Faldara and Tarvalon, but it is still a bit of a trek, so it's possible to have perhaps the episode start with a bit of moraine and land setting up some things occurring right after the events of the finale, perhaps with some Rand stuff in the intermediary, and then proceeding to set up Perrin, Uno, Loyal, Inktar, and others to try and have to chase down the horn, and then jumping to a place where Egwene and Nynaeve have recovered and have traveled to Tarvalon and find Matt at the tower, perhaps captured by the Aes Sedai, or maybe even just coming there willingly, looking for the dagger, or at least something with a little bit of Shadar Logoth juju attached to it. It's also at the White Tower where I believe we need to meet some new and establish these new characters. Some significant Aes Sedai, such as Shiriam, the Mistress of Novices, with Rima Tiwieta taking that role, 
And as we know, Ethereum serves both as kind of a foil for our upstart novices, but also sometimes the greatest ally for them as well. The former being in episode one and the latter being in episode three, but I'll get to that when we get to episode three. We're also likely to meet a very important Aes Sedai named Varen, who is a member of the Brown Aja and can also be a foil or also a help. Varen will be played by Mira Sael. And there's been a couple of still images leaked of her in costume, perhaps. I'm not sure how much I put stock into those. But one thing that I can put stock in is footage released from promotional material from the official Twitter. And some of that shows a shot of Egwene and then a quick shot of Matt. And to me, it appears that they are having a conversation in the White Tower itself. And I believe that this will take place in the first episode. I can't argue too much with the fact that some people might think that these cuts of Egwene to Matt are from separate scenes. I cannot totally discount that. But I actually believe that those shots to be part of the same scene. And I'm really not hedging any bets here. So again, feel free to reach out if I'm wrong about that or when I'm wrong about that, perhaps, and give a full laugh in my face. I can take it, and I'll likely laugh along right with you. More critical meetings at the White Tower in this first episode, I believe that we will meet Elaine Tracklin, the daughter heir to Queen Margaise of Andor, and aspiring Aes Sedai in the first episode, perhaps with her already being at the Tower when Egwene and Nynaeve arrive, or perhaps arriving at about the same time. But that relationship will need to start to be fleshed out, as we know, as it becomes very important as the books go on. Elaine is being played this upcoming season by Sarah Coveney, and I'm really looking forward to the introduction of this character. She's a character who was actually introduced in book one, but the television show omitted her introduction to the series by skipping over our group's trek stop to Camelin, which is where the seat of her mother's throne is. So, in lieu of that, an introduction between Egwene and Nynaeve at the Tower makes perfect sense, because in a way, it did play like that in the books as well. Remember that Elaine only met Rand in book one. Also, as I mentioned in passing, I believe that we're going to need this time jump fairly early in the season simply to allow a couple of kind of practical things to happen. Loyal and Uno definitely need to heal from wounds inflicted upon them by Pat and Fane's actions when he took the horn. Egwene and Nynaeve will need time to recover themselves a little bit before traveling to tar And a time jump allows that stuff that we don't need to see, and I'm quite certain we will not see, to just pass, and we can move right on to the important things, like these introductions, or Perrin and Uno and Loyal taking off to chase Pat and Fane. And out of our main characters, that basically just leaves Moraine and Lan. And as I said before, I suspect, since the promotional material has already betrayed the big fact that really Rand did not destroy the Dark One, but instead released one of the Dark One's strongest lieutenants, i.e. Ishmael, I think a good place to start with Moraine and Lan is to actually pick up from the seal, or just slightly after that, and Moraine and Lan, either between themselves or or to the group back at Faldara, will discuss in greater detail some of the things that have happened in order to set the stakes for the season, and perhaps the greater stakes for the entire series. After that, I'm not certain how much more of that we'll get for the rest of the episode. There is, of course, the question of Min leaving Faldara, and we can ask if it was because Moraine had specifically sent her to the tower, or simply someplace south. Another way a time jump right after setting the stakes benefits the show is that we're going to need some of that time at the tower to develop the dynamic of this entire group there. That group including Egwene, Nynaeve, Elaine, and possibly Min as well. And when you put all of this other stuff in there, it doesn't leave a whole lot more time for Moraine in the rest of this episode except to set up the stakes for everyone. We are keeping in mind that in a Q&A session on Twitter on July... 21st of 2022, Ray specifically said the following about Moraine's story for season two. Another big departure point for us from the books is making much more story for Moraine and Land. 
we aren't sitting these two actors on the bench for an entire season, so we take what's in book two for them and expand it in a huge way. That's all I can say. And while Moraine's involvement in The Great Hunt, I suppose, does seem diminished slightly from Eye of the World, I think there still is plenty enough for Rafe to expand on from The Great Hunt. I just don't know how much of that we need in the very first episode. Rest assured, I'm definitely betting that, as Bubba said, you can't have Moraine be inactive for too long with no power. I am also certain that you can't have too much episode time without Moraine being in it. And those are my thoughts about Season 2, Episode 1, likely titled A Taste of Solitude, which actually works out well as a title thematically for Rand and Moraine, uh, and even Matt to a degree. I suppose Egwene might feel slightly alone in the kitchens, too. What do you think about my layout of the episode so far? Leave me comments in our videos at youtube.com slash at the word double the letter P, the word media, or you can tweet to at the word double the letters PHQ or to at bus blockbuster, or you can shoot an email to me by sending it to mattsaudioblog at gmail.com, M-A-T-T-S audioblog at gmail.com. I really want to hear what you think episode one is going to entail. And with that said, let's move on to season two, episode two. For episode two, John from the What Up channel speculated from the list of titles that we have and selected Eyes Without Pity. And John reasons that because we know Rafe's Twitter Q&A said that we will see the Dark Friends social, and both the Forsaken and the Dark Friends tend to do evil things without mercy for their prey, that title choice is a good selection. I like this reasoning. I agree with John that we will get the Dark Friends social in Episode 2. And that's despite the fact that the Dark Friends social is actually a prologue in The Great Hunt. But I believe that if we do go with my idea and have that time jump in the first episode, it's probably best to set up our main protagonists in their new situation in Episode 1. We can then give our villains Episode 2 to set up their situation. And a great way to open up episode two would be with the Dark Friends social. I also believe that we've seen a shot of that gathering in official material released by the show where the Dark One slash Ishmael meets at the table with 11 other people, all of them being veiled. There is some debate as to whether these are forsaken or not, but since there is 12 as opposed to 13, And because they are all veiled, I believe that these are dark friends. And this group of dark friends even comes complete with representatives of the White Cloaks, the Red Aja, and perhaps a Black Aja as well, which makes me very excited. But there are other things that we have to see regarding the villain side as well. During that Q&A, Rafe was asked to, quote, blink twice if we would see more than one forsaken this season, and he responded with two blinking emojis. I believe that the bloody hand that we see in Wheel of Time promotional material is Lanfear's hand, and I believe the shots before that showing Ishmael is basically telling the story of him freeing her from her prison. I think we need to see both of these before we get to episode three, where the focus will likely return back to the White Tower which I'll get to in the next section. And we need to introduce Lanfear before the focus starts shifting to Falma, presumably by episode 5. I also think the title Eyes Without Mercy works well for another reason, or actually several other reasons. There are other sets of eyes that we need to introduce, or perhaps reintroduce, before the group chasing Pot and Fane gets too far along the way to Falma. First, think of Perrin's eyes as eyes without mercy, perhaps, because they didn't seem too merciful in the White Cloak camp outside of Tarvalin in Season 1, right? And this episode might be a perfect time to introduce an element from Book 1 that was missed, and an interesting scene from Chapter 28 of Book 2 that might help to reinforce the interest of the Aeel, at least regarding Rand, 
because we know there's going to be several IEL in Falma according to the episode 8 images. So let's talk about all of this first in regards to book 1 things. WOTseries.com has learned that Gary Beadle has been cast in the role of Elias. Elias is the wolf brother who lots of fans complained about not being in season 1 during Perrin and Egwene's adventure after Shada Rogoth. So it appears that Rafe is taking an effort to make things up to book readers and perhaps have Elias help Perrin learn more about what he is becoming. And I'm predicting that this appearance will be in this episode. Not only that, but the wolf dreams may be a part of Perrin's story as well, as during that Twitter Q&A, Rafe made an all-caps official announcement saying that the wolf Hopper would be appearing in season two. I believe as long as we're getting Elias in this episode, it makes it a perfect opportunity to meet Hopper as well. And perhaps it might be too much to ask to have Perrin's group encounter Yuri and the Aiel in the same episode, but I believe that this episode will be bad guys heavy and Perrin heavy, with splashes of our other characters mixed in here and there. So I hope that we get the Yuri appearance here. As I mentioned before, this would seal the interest of the Aiel in Rand before the story gets too far along, and this gives Avienda and other Aiel a chance to eventually catch up to everyone, either at Falma or before Falma. Now, what would seal the deal for the Aiel interest? That would be the conversation between Urien and Perrin's group in Chapter 28 of The Great Hunt. Here's a truncated quote from that chapter that explains the Isle interest as told by Urien. I search for someone, a man. His eyes ran across Perrin, Matt, the Shinarans, dismissing them all. He who comes with the dawn. It is said that there will be great signs and portents of his coming. It is said we will know them when we hear of them as we will know him when we see him, for he will be marked. He will come from the west, beyond the spine of the world, but be of our blood. He will go to Rudion and lead us out of the threefold land. He took his spear in his right hand. In the dirt, Urien scraped a circle with his spear point, and then he drew across a sinuous line. It is said that under this sign, he will conquer. Ingtar frowned at the symbol no recognition on his face, but Matt muttered something coarsely under his breath and Perrin felt his mouth go dry, the ancient symbol of the Aes Sedai. And of course, there is one more group that we could categorize as having eyes without mercy, especially having very little mercy for those who do not follow the light. That's right. I believe that we're going to get a taste of the White Cloaks again in this particular episode. And again, it kind of revolves around Perrin. Remember that in both book one and in season one of the show, Perrin has definitely made an enemy of the White Cloaks. We might once again see Child Valda. You know, speaking of Perrin's, quote, atrocities outside of Tarvalin. And this would be a perfect opportunity also to introduce Dane Bornholt, a new character for the show who will be played in Season 2 by Jay Duffy, and that was announced officially at JordanCon 2023. And other than perhaps little splashes from our main characters that I mentioned before, slightly progressing their own stories, I believe that that's what we'll see in Episode 2. Once again, feel free to comment on YouTube, or reach out to me or the Double P in the ways that I mentioned before, because I want to know what you think will happen in Episode 2. Episode 3 is the one where I feel like a lot of things are very confirmable by evidence, but I'm not sure that all of it will happen. Nonetheless, there's a lot to talk about regarding the story potentials for Episode 3, so let's jump in quickly because I'm already starting to run behind. John from the What Up YouTube channel has suspected that the title of this third episode to be What Might Be, 
And I think that the speculation, even if none of his other guesses would turn out to be correct, is exactly right. Two of the eight images featured in the Entertainment Weekly article are tied to this episode by the press release. One being of Nynaeve standing in a stone room in her shift, and the other one being of Land Mandragoran atop his beautiful horse. The place where Nynaeve is seen actually matches the set that Rafe answered questions for JordanCon 2023, and we also saw Aiel cast members on that set as well, simply to be introduced, but it was Avienda, Bane, and Chiat. Now, when you look at the shots of Rafe and the cast, you see a wider view of that set, and it reveals arches. These arches are likely the Terangriol used for the testing of the Accepted, which is a status for Aes Sedai that is right in between the novice and the full Aes Sedai. You graduate from novice to accepted, and then you graduate from accepted to full Aes Sedai status. The room itself is described in chapter 23 of The Great Hunt that is titled The Testing, and that description seems to match exactly what we're seeing in these images. The domed room had been carved out of the bedrock of the island. The light of the lamps on tall stands reflected from pale, smooth stone walls. Centered under the dome was a thing made of three rounded silver arches, each just tall enough to walk under, sitting on a thick silver ring with their ends touching each other. Arches and ring were all of one piece. She could not see what lay inside, There, the light flickered oddly and made her stomach flutter with it, as if she'd looked too long. In the show, given Nynaeve's great display of healing power in Episode 4 of Season 1, it would make sense that she would actually test before Egwene, even though she might be far less interested in becoming an actual Aes Sedai than Egwene. And while the situation that produces her testing first is a little bit different in the books, Nynaeve does actually test first. As for the potential title of the episode itself, what might be, that's a key phrase here, because it does not exactly match what is said by Shiriam who is a character we probably will have introduced in the first episode. Because in chapter 23, the testing, Shiriam actually walks Nynaeve through her test, in a way, from arch to arch, where Nynaeve must pass through these arches, and a potential accepted is transported to another place to face a fear that they might have. I will say that I've always interpreted the fear thing as being having to leave the situation behind that they are placed in. And this is because once they are in the situation, the arch disappears and then it will reappear, but only once. And if they do not make it back through the arch, they may be trapped in that situation forever. The kick is, is that the fear actually comes from you being tempted to stay because the situation is either so dire or you feel like you need to stay there in order to fix things or the situation is so wonderful that you don't want to return the fear is actually in leaving the situation as you might guess as we have a ghost of christmas past christmas present christmas future the arches kind of work in the same way the first arch is for what was and it explores what our character's past might be maybe not even the past of their own lifetime but a previous lifetime because remember that wheel of time is all about the repetition of lives in a cycle sort of a reincarnation of sorts so Nynaeve's first test takes her back to the past during the Trolloc Wars where she faces off against one of the forsaken Agamar and she's handling him well but the arch then appears and the fear that she's facing is having to leave before she's been able to finally take care of Agamar The second arch is for what is. That's where Nynaeve uh, is is taken back to the two rivers in the current day, but it's all amok because the wisdom that took over for her is terrorizing the two rivers, basically. 
and she doesn't want to leave because she fears what will happen to her friends, to her family, well, your quasi-family at the Two Rivers. The third arch, Shiriam actually says, is for what will be, not what might be. And once again, from chapter 23 of The Great Hunt, the testing will hear this. Nynaeve licked her lips. If I refuse, you'll put me out of the tower and never let me come back. Shiriam nodded. And this is the worst. Shiriam nodded again. Nynaeve drew breath. I am ready. The third time, Shiriam intoned formally, is for what will be. The way back will come but once. Be steadfast. Nynaeve threw herself at the arch in a run. So why change this? Think of the phrase that I said at the beginning of this segment, potential storylines. The changing of the wording allows this to not be so overwhelmingly inevitable. And this way, some things for characters other than Nynaeve can be explored with this frame of mind as well. For instance, what about the potential of Moraine never getting her powers back and actually being helpless against Fades and other Shadowspawn? as I believe we actually see in footage from the official promotional material. That may be happening in this episode. Is there a possibility even that we might meet Fael in Perry's journey to Falma? Remember that Saldea is on the way to Falma for him, sort of. And she is a hunter of the horn, sort of. And that could potentially bring the introduction of her character forward from Book 3 of Dragon Reborn. I've got more on that in a minute. Finally, what about the potential of Egwene meeting Gawain at the Tower? Perhaps in this episode, if not before. And thus, starting the long kind of overarching relationship between the two of them. My point is, as you can see, that there are lots of might-be potentials, and that way it's not leading viewers to believe these things will absolutely happen. But I haven't mentioned Nynaeve's third test yet, the what might be or what will be, and there's a lot of wish fulfillment in Nynaeve's third arch, and it's kind of heartbreaking as well because she's got to choose to leave a potential life with Lan, and it seems like his kingdom of Makir has been restored, and that in this situation they've been married and they have children, and it's just seems like a really lovely place. And the description of that place and the mood of the situation, as described in chapter 23 of The Great Hunt, I think does make it a very tempting place to just stay behind and let the arch go away and be stuck there forever. Below the hill, the necklace of the Thousand Lakes spread through the city of Malkir, reflecting the cloud-brushing Seven Towers, with the golden crane banners flying at their heights in the mist. The city had a thousand gardens, but she preferred this wild garden on the hilltop. The way back will come but once, be steadfast. The sound of hooves made her turn. Alan Mandragoran, King of Malkir, leaped from the back of his charger and strode toward her through the butterflies, laughing. Now we've seen an image of Nynaeve uh, standing in a field, which I believe is probably from one of these tests, possibly this third test. The only thing that I'm wondering is if that jives with my other kind of speculation about what the image of land tied to this episode is about. Because that image looks so idealized that I believe that it might be from this third test. But he's in the woods, she's in a field, so those two don't jive. Of course, this image of land could actually be him tracking down or protecting Moraine potentially as she is making her way to Carrion, which kind of brings me off Nynaeve's test to other story potentials in this episode. 
but let's stick to the White Tower for a moment while we're here, and then we'll work our way out to the other characters. A lot has to happen in this episode in order to get the characters Nynaeve, Elaine, Egwene, and potentially Men to start to make their way to Falma. For one thing, we're definitely going to need some more Matt Cawthon. Now, I think there's a potential, since Matt is already back in Tarvala, we might bring forward some book three things into the second season because Matt in book two actually travels with Perrin. So while he's here at Tarvala this time, let's take care of a few of those things. And I'll start with the fact that while there doesn't seem to be any evidence of casting of Galad, one of Elaine's siblings, actually a half-sibling, Rafe has teased the potential for Gawain and Fael both in a CBR.com interview, basically at the conclusion of season one. So, we have an opportunity here with Matt to get him broken free of the bond with the dagger, as happens in book three, and he can take episode two off to recover, so to speak, from that. But then here in episode three, we could have him doing the staff sparring. Of course, it would only be with Gawain instead of Gawain and Galad. But there's a potential for that happening in this episode. There's also a shot in the promotional footage with uh, warders or potentially training warders using staffs. On top of that, there's also a shot from official materials that while it appears to be Matt and Falma, given the clothes that he's wearing, I think it might be more around Tar Valen. Now, it could potentially be him coming off uh, one of his famous gambling or drinking sprees, or it could potentially be back from episode one, uh, where he is taken to the White Tower. But either way, we need to get Matt in better shape, because we know that if they do stay true to the books, as far as Matt goes, he will need to be in Falma in order to blow the Horn of Valir. The problem with him being at the Tower now is since he does travel with Perrin in the book story, I guess he will have to travel with Nynaeve and her gang in the TV story. At any rate, I feel like we can get a lot of this book three stuff in Tarvalin out of the way before episode four, and we kind of need to have things wrapped up at the Tower by no later than mid-episode 4, because of the potential episode title for episode 5. And I'll get more on that soon. Is it possible that we might get the Gray Man into the tower this time around? Could this be a potential way that Leandrin kind of ends up luring Nynaeve's group to Falma? Now, I gotta admit, I'm purely speculating here. I'm not going to include that in the list for this episode. But uh, it would be a fun potential, a f fun way to work around Swan just telling the girls to look after who they suspect is bad and them following Leandrin and then end up getting captured probably in the end of episode four. Speaking of Swan, that official footage of her looking very regal also must either happen in this episode or it's already happened. The surrounding looks kind of like Tarvalon to me. And there's really no need for Swan to go to Faldara, since she's already been informed by Moraine about the Taviran in Season 1. There's just no need for that kind of emissary-type trip in this season. Now working our way outward, while I mentioned the potential of Fael and Perrin, there are some things in the long picture of this season that we need to look at. As I mentioned, we know in Episode 5, that image of Loyal seemingly being a servant to the Shan Shan is tied there. We also have a shot in official footage of him being tied up and fighting fiercely against that. Throw on top of that that there is uh, plenty of footage of Shinarans seemingly fighting Shan Shan at night. It seems to me that if Loyal is among that group, and there's no reason to think that he won't be, and if he gets captured then if we are going to introduce Fael here, she would also be captured. And we've not really seen any indication of Fael being in the season, except for there is this one shot from official material where Perrin and the Shinarans have pinned a fade to the door. 
and one of the people present in the lower left has the potential to be a female or Fael, but Occam's razor probably says it could just be a villager. It's just that this person is dressed very differently from the Shinar, so we know it's not one member of that troop. So will we get Fael in this episode? I don't know. The bottom line really is that unless Fael is going to come to Falma on her own, maybe searching for the horn for herself, which, by the way, is a very plausible reason, but if she is going to be in the season at all, then we need to get to her before that shot, obviously, of the fade being pinned against the wall, if that is her, or at least before the battle with the Shan Shan which, again, I feel like has to occur in episode four. And then with Rand and Moraine, we at least need to be setting up Carrion in this episode, even if we don't get there. Because we know that the image of Moraine is tied to episode four. And that set that she's on uh, has been reported to be Carrion, and it's probably the foregate, or around the foregate of Carrion. We've also seen shots of official material of Rand on a very similar set. Perhaps one where there is a fire, or maybe some other kind of attack taking place there. And what you have to say is for potentially Moraine and Rand to both be in Carrion by episode four, there has to be a reason for them to get there. So you've got to set that up either in episodes two or episode three. I have to admit, and I mentioned these shots earlier, but I'm a little puzzled by the shots of Moraine looking scared with a dagger in official material, uh, seemingly still having no powers to protect her from some kind of shadow spawn. And I ask, where is Lan at this point? There's been some suggestions, and I'm not sure, but could I reveal early on about perhaps her suggesting Land bond with Morel because of her loss of powers? Could that be a potential reason for splitting them up? Or is he just not in any of these shots because he's trying to circle around the enemy and, and get him out of the way? Of course, one reason we can have Moraine go to Carrion is to potentially find someone to help her with the shielding weave that she's under. And you can speculate that perhaps politics, uh, which is what we'll see Swan involved with probably at the Tower, perhaps those politics at the Tower would keep her from going there for a solution. So what does she do? She returns to the place where she does still have at least a little shred of power, even if she doesn't have the one power, she has power and carry it, since she was a potential heir for the throne there. As for Rand having a reason to go to Carrion, I mean, I have no, absolutely no idea. In the books, he's kind of seeking Selene, right? And of course, we know Selene is land fear. So if that's the case, might we get a meeting between them in this episode, or maybe even in the episode before, that ends up spurring him on towards Carrion? from wherever he is coming out of the waste. And I think that that's all that I have for this episode. So what do you think? Let me know in the video comments or reach out to me in the ways that I've mentioned before. And I'm really, really running long in this podcast. There's no way I'm going to get through all eight episodes. So I'm going to do just one more episode, split it right in two, stop after episode four for this podcast. And then I'll return sometime in the near future for episodes 5 through 8. And actually, as I think of it, it may be a bit before I can get back to that, but more on that after we get through episode 4, potentially titled Strangers and Friends. For episode 4, John from the What Up YouTube channel has speculated the title to be Strangers and Friends, which to me seems somewhat appropriate for Moraine's situation, probably in Carrion, as indicated by the press release photo of her standing likely within the foregate of that city. But I also suspect that Rand has to end up there as well. And we know that Tom Marilyn is not going to be in the season, so those interactions aren't likely to happen for Rand. 
because the actor has already confirmed as much that he won't be in season two. This means that the only real motivation for Rand to be in Carrion himself is likely to be an encounter with Lanfear in a prior episode, which I mentioned when we were talking about the last episode. And when exactly he will arrive in this episode, I'm not sure, but I think we will see his arrival. So that encounter with Lanfear could happen here or prior. I also think that we will see Rand and Moraine meet up at some point here in Carrion and both carry their way to Falma, however it is that they're going to get there. And they might meet up by the end of this episode. But I suspect most of the stuff in Carrion for this episode will probably be Moraine in her quest to get that knot untied from the weave that is shielding her. Ran asking about Selene or Lanfear, and perhaps them just bumping into each other at the end of the episode. Now, as I mentioned in my comments regarding the last episode, there is an image from episode 5 of Loyal seemingly being subservient to Sarath, Alwyn, and the Dark One slash Ishmael, and that tells us some things about what must happen by no later than this episode. We know there are several shots in footage of Shinarans fighting with Shan Shan at night, as well as a shot of Loyal being restrained with ropes and screaming, and it's horrible. So that has to happen before Loyal can be a servant, so I believe that the night battle between the Shan Shan and the Shinarans will take place in this episode. Perhaps near the end, we might even get the next day scene of... Perrin being presented and his group being presented to Sarath, but if not, then we'll get it by the next episode. This, of course, means that any battle with Shadow Spawn likely will have had to take place earlier because you just can't have two big fights in an episode. Well, I suppose you could, but it would seem like you would be taken away from the potential to have things in other episodes. So. I believe that that will have already happened where the fade's been pinned to the door. Perhaps we'll have met Fael, perhaps not. Perhaps she won't show up till the end of the season, if she shows up at all. But there are other key things that have to happen, and this is based on the title that John suspects this episode is called, because we do have a lot of Sean Shan in the next episode. We know from the photo, John from What Up Channel speculated that the next episode title will be Damani. Well... Damani is someone who is imprisoned, as I've mentioned before, by a controller using a collar that makes them wield the one power in the way that that controller kind of wants them to. There are some critical scenes in the books of Egwene being collared like that. And because of that, if the title of episode 5 is in fact Damani, the Damani has to be Egwene, which means that she has to get there in order to be captured. She has to get to Falma. So that means that Nynaeve, Egwene, Elaine, and possibly Min as well, and maybe even possibly Matt, he might come with them because I can't think of any other way for him to get to Falma so that he can blow the horn. And they need to either be duped by Leandrin to go with her, or uh, following Leandrin through the ways. So we have to have that happen so that they can come out through the way gate in Falma, which we've also seen footage of. Now, will we get all of Egwene's story in the collar in episode five? Probably not. But the point is that she must at least be captured by this episode in order to be, to be presented as a Damani in the next episode, if that is the title. Perhaps they could delay it out a little bit to where they just arrive in Falma in the next episode. But I think a good ending for this episode would actually be kind of a cut back and forth to Perrin and his group being taken and Egwene being taken. Great mid-season cliffhanger, even though there won't be any break between the episodes. So those are my thoughts regarding the first four episodes of season two of The Wheel of Time on Amazon Prime. I'm very sorry that I couldn't get through all of the episodes in this podcast. I suppose I could, but it'd be well over two hours long. And who wants to hear me talk for two hours? Unfortunately, I'm also not really going to be very available for the next 30 days or so. I have a lot of things on my plate and some interesting things on my plate. 
that I can't really discuss too much, but I'm going to be very busy for the rest of June and on into most of July. Therefore, I won't be able to conclude this speculation until close to August. And perhaps by then we'll have trailers, we'll have new information, uh, and my predicting will be a little bit more accurate. Although, I will uh, stand by all of this until I'm proven otherwise, and uh, you all can feel free to make fun of me. More importantly, I would love to hear your opinions about what you think is going to happen within each of these episodes. You can tweet to at Bus Blockbuster or to the word double, the letters PHQ. You can send emails to mattsaudioblog at gmail.com, M-A-T-T-S audioblog at gmail.com. Or you can leave comments in the videos at the Double P Media YouTube channel at youtube.com slash at the word double, the letter P, the word media. Thanks so much for listening, and I can't wait to hear your thoughts and your takes or your opinions of my takes regarding The Wheel of Time Season 2. This has been Matt. Take care, my friends.